Moncaster Castle was constructed way back in 1325 on the west coast of Cumbria, and at the time of publication of the Strange But True book, the owner of the castle was a Patrick Duff Gordon Pennington. From ghostly entities pulling doors shut on Patrick to phantom footsteps following him around the castle, it is safe to say that Patrick had his first share of experiences. Patrick discovered that it wasn't only himself that could sense a strange atmosphere around the castle, his dog could too. Between the back door and my office, come snow, come hail or shine, every night footsteps used to follow me in the dark in the winter and I didn't like it one little bit. And the dogs don't like it much either. I've always thought this house was a fairly normal house, but just lately it's become extremely strange. Patrick believed that his dog could sense the presence of ghosts that roamed around the castle, especially around a 600-year-old chestnut tree on the castle grounds. But it's one ghost in particular that Patrick believed his dogs could sense, and that was the ghost of Tom Skelton. Tom Fool. Now it's said that Tom was Moncaster's castle steward and its very last fool way back in the 16th century, and it is also said that Tom wasn't a very nice man. Legend has it that Tom Fool liked to sit beneath the chestnut tree on the castle grounds. If unsuspecting visitors came across Tom Fool and asked him for directions to London, if Tom didn't like the look of them, he would direct them to the bottom of the riverbank where there was a patch of quicksand. His victims would get stuck and Tom Fool would make his way down and simply watch them sink to their death. Over the many years, historians have looked into the dark background of Tom Fool and learned that he liked to use his innocent image of a fool to gain people's trust. Legend has it, he was a very, very clever man, but he was also a very, very sadistic man and very, very dangerous. And Tom Fool may also have been responsible for the death of a local carpenter. Legend states that Tom was also responsible for the gruesome murder of a carpenter within the castle grounds, an act he carried out to win favour with his master, Sir William Pennington. He was murdered in cold blood by Tom Fool, who then proceeded to hack off his head with a hammer and chisel. Tom Fool quickly disposed of the body, probably in the quicksand, but for some strange reason he decided to keep the head and he proudly showed it to the then owner of the castle, Sir William Pennington. And it is said that when he presented the decapitated head of the carpenter to his master, he also cracked a joke. And legend has it that there and then, that is where the phrase tomfoolery was actually born, all because of Tom Skelton, Tom Fool. The tales of Tom Fool and a headless carpenter make for a good ghost story. But can all the bumps and bangs in the castle really be attributed to a 16th century jester? More recent incidents seem to have nothing to do with Tom Fool. More disturbing than anything that's gone before, these experiences centre on this room in the castle, the tapestry room. Over the many years, the tapestry room has become a hotspot for paranormal activity in the castle. It is said that female visitors try to avoid the tapestry room at all costs, and on the rare occasions that females have entered into the tapestry room, they have felt an overwhelming feeling of uneasiness. On one particular night, the late Lord Carlisle spent the night in the tapestry room, but he didn't slip a wink, and this was due to the haunting sounds of a crying baby coming from somewhere in the room. Ten minutes later, the chilling sounds eventually evaporated into nothingness. On another occasion, the curator of the castle also had his own experience when he was going round, closing all the shutters on the windows, he noticed a strange woman walking down one of the corridors. She was wearing a brown nightdress and her hair was up in a bun. Now, despite the lady wearing a nightdress, his first rational thought was that she was a visitor of the hotel that had somehow got locked in after visiting hours. So we proceeded down the corridor to follow her and just explain to her that the castle is now closed and she needed to leave. As he rounded the corner, he noticed that the lady walked straight through one of the castle doors. And I don't mean she opened the door, I mean she actually walked straight through it. It is now believed that the ghostly image of the lady may be the mother of a former owner of the castle, and it is said that she wore a brown nightgown to bed with her hair tied up in a bun. Another story comes from a garden curator who spent the night in a room directly next to the tapestry room. It is said that whilst he was in bed, he witnessed the wooden door swing open not once, but twice and he swears there was no one else in that part of the castle with him that night. And then there's the story of the lady who becomes separated from the castle tour guide, and she somehow found herself standing right in front of Tom Fool's portrait. Now, as this lady stood there beneath the very creepy portrait of Tom Fool, she actually heard someone approach from behind. She actually heard the footsteps on the stone floors of the castle. 
and she actually commented to this person who she believed was behind her about this picture she was staring at. And when there was no answer, the lady turned around to find that there was nobody there. But this confused her. She was 100% certain that she'd heard the footsteps on the stone floors of the castle, which may I add, was fully carpeted. There is no way she could have heard any footsteps approach her from behind. And then there's the story of James Cartland, who was a family friend of the castle owners. And one particular night, he stayed in the tapestry room. It was a cold night and he decided to get himself into bed and read. It wasn't long before he started to hear the ghostly sounds of a baby crying once again. But this time it was accompanied by the sounds of another ghostly voice coming in as though they were trying to soothe the child. This lasted for about 10 minutes before once again the very chilling sounds just faded away into the night. The very next morning James arrived at breakfast and the other guests around the table could see that James hadn't slept a wink as you can imagine and then he went on to tell his story to the guests around the table. One particular lady looked very shocked and she insisted that James speak to her daughter who had stayed there a year before and she had experienced something quite similar to what James had. So the story goes that the previous year the lady's daughter stayed in the tapestry room and on the very first night she experienced some very strange things. First of all she heard footsteps outside of the room and then the door swing open not once but twice. She said that was bad enough but what she would experience the next night was even worse. Now the very next night as the lady lay there in bed the activity started up again. Once again she heard footsteps outside the room but this time it was accompanied by the voices of children. Now at first she said this wasn't too bad. That is until the voices of the children started to either chant or sing. She couldn't decide which it was but what she knew is that it was very very unsettling and she did not sleep a wink that night. And what she is sure of is that she was the only person in that part of the castle. Now, I just want to add that sometime later, there were some plans that were found in the attic of the castle. And these plans suggested that the tapestry room was actually used as a nursery at some point in the 19th century. And we'll come back to this later. In 1994, a scientific study was set up in the tapestry room of the castle. The study was run by Melanie Warren and Ian Topan, who spent the night in the castle. Ian was staying in the tapestry room and at around 2.45 a.m. he noticed a very dark figure enter into the room slowly at first and then slowly and gradually make its way closer to Ian before disappearing before his very eyes. Ian couldn't believe what he had just seen. He was questioning himself whether he had actually seen it at all. Just at that moment, Melanie rushed into the room. She was staying in a room just directly across the way and she'd actually seen the shadow figure enter the room just as Ian had, but from a different perspective. When she entered the room, she noticed that there was no shadow figure in sight. There was no one else in the room but Ian. They had both seen the same thing and neither of them had any explanation for what they had seen. But Melanie remembers walking into the room and seeing Ian as white as a sheet. Now, before I end the story of the haunting of Moncaster Castle, I just briefly want to go back to the possibility that the tapestry room may have been a nursery at some point in the 19th century. Apparently, there was a lady down in the village who died at the very old age of 92, but before she died, she gave a very interesting story to the lady of the castle. The old lady told the lady of the castle that her grandfather once knew the late Lord Moncaster's daughter, who was called Margaret Moncaster, and unfortunately she had passed away at the very young age of 11, way back in 1871. Apparently the little girl had screaming fits and she could have been ill for quite some time. And it is possible and stands to reason that if the tapestry room was used as a nursery, then this could have been the room that little Margaret took her last breath before she died. And maybe, just maybe, it's the little girl's cries that are echoing through the centuries and are heard by anybody who is brave enough to sleep in the tapestry room.